So I figured people had seen my talk um, or maybe talk about things, and I wanted to talk about uh, something even provocative, new thinking. And so you can see the title. Um, and of course, the giving a title with a talk that says the white matter bundles don't exist at SSG is a little bit provocative and heretical, obviously, given that I dedicated an entire chapter of my book about white matter bundles. And that, so what we're really not saying is that we should ignore white matter out of here. Obviously, I don't believe that. Or that white matter bundles don't, white matter fibers don't run together in bundles that we can see, dissect, pull out on DTI, et cetera. <clears throat> what I mean by it is that there are better, more clinically useful, and more neuroscientifically relevant ways to understand the cognitive system of the brain. And if we want to try to push the boundary forward, we need to start rearranging our thinking around the best thinking that's available in neuroscience. Now, again, we have known for a long time that there are white matter axonal projections that coalesce together to connect the areas over long ranges. So uh, we've known that since the 1920s from fiber dissections. But the answer is that our goal when we do surgery isn't to preserve anatomy that was visible to the naked eye in the 1920s. We care about preserving function and we care about preserving these bundles only to the extent that we care about function. So of course, if you cut across that, um, you're, it's bad, right? But the fact is that there are fibers and side parts of it that are also important. And the, the bundle concept really doesn't allow us to understand what is important, what is not. And so we attend meetings like SSG, not because we uh, want to, you know, learn a better way to do motor mapping. Obviously, there's little nuances and tricks, but there's a lot of different ways to do it, and we're pretty good at it. We want to try to learn things that we don't have under control. And really what it means is we want to remove lesions with fewer problems, fewer bad outcomes, and fewer mistakes. And as we begin to move towards concepts like supermaximal resection, where we talk about taking a margin, and again, I've been talking about that for a long time, <laughs> going back to over 10 years now. So I obviously believe in the oncological benefits of it. And margins are good in every cancer. But what about what's in the margin? And sometimes that margin is the motor cortex, brainstem, or it could be someone's cognitive system. And so we really have to have rational ways where we put trade-offs. And there's just a limit to how much understanding the, the fiber bundle anatomy will really get us there. So while it was not good to cut through the middle of it, we need to push a little bit further. And the reason we know this is that if we start studying our patients and we start talking about people who undergo surgery for gliomas, we think we do a great job. And in the case of motor and speech, we're pretty good at it. But when we start talking about you know, things beyond the neurosurgical intact, which is moving all four talking and you know, having getting clearing PT, we start looking at the fact that substantial percentages of our patients have new mental illness after we operate on them for gliomas, and that this vastly exceeds other very bad cancers like pancreatic cancer, where that number is closer to the population incidence of uh, uh, major depression, then we have to recognize that we're doing something to the cognitive and emotional systems of the brain in some of these people that is not good. And so part of the reason I picked that provocative title for my talk is that there's some harms in having an oversimplified view of how the brain actually works. And having an under, inaccurate view of functional anatomy ca can cause problems. So it's good to show that there's a white matter bundle, but if you read the literature, and obviously I have, um, there are lots of contradicting and bizarre uh, attributions to what, what a specific white matter bundle does. And part of it is that they're multimodal. So for example, that white matter bundle is a collection of, of connections between different areas. Okay, so what is that particular area doing? Well, it could be doing a lot of different things. And then even some of these areas are even more complex than this. And so how do we know what all, which one of those fibers is which? And which one of the things we're willing, we're willing to sacrifice and which ones we're not? So the bundle concept, again, we don't want to cut through the middle of it because we're disconnecting lots of different things. So it's necessary, but not sufficient. And so if you map out a white matter bundle, this is our map of IFOS, you can see that there's an enormous number of things connected. And some of those things are visual system areas, that tends to be most of it. Some of those things are things like cognitive areas, and it becomes really hard to describe what does IFOF actually do if we just think about it as a unitary structure and not as a sum of its connections. Similarly, we start talking about the arcuate fasciculus. 
And I've had discussions with people at this meeting about this. The arc of fasciculus is an incredibly complex structure. There's lots of things going through it that have nothing to do with each other. So in order for us to really understand which one of these twigs stays, which one of them goes, which one of them can we super maximally resect, which can we not, we have to start really thinking about this problem a little differently. So again, cutting through the middle of this at its, at its stem while it's hooking around is bad because look at all the things you disconnect, self-evident. But the issue with it is it's not enough to really help us make all of the good decisions because anytime we're making a decision to back off, we're leaving tumor and vice versa. When we don't back off, we're removing something that's connected to something. <laughs> now, the other thing about it when we start looking at tractography is people have spent a lot of time, if you read the tractography literature, there's a lot of effort trying to make this really, really beautiful picture of how do we get the a canonical, beautiful view of the cortical spinal tract. And you can see in this paper, the authors spent the time to look at all these extra connections that were found from the seed and say, oh, well, those are all false. Well, some of them may be, and maybe connecting two sides on a brain that we know doesn't happen. But if you look at some of these things, what if those are just important by hemispheric connections? So we haven't been talking about that. We don't have a name for the connections between the two motor systems through the corpus callosum. But we know that that picture on the right doesn't really describe the motor system very accurately. So if we go from saying, let's make very pretty pictures of tracks to actually let's figure out how we can use tractography to define function, it's actually, we can start focusing our efforts not on making idealized pictures of tracks, but at making you know, meaningful network-based con uh, connections that actually answer our questions. And so one of the challenges with tractography is we know that there's value in it. We know that you can do a lot of things with it. And it's really great for advertising. I'm sure most people have seen this. And the question is, where's the answer in there? Okay. And so that's the challenge. Making pretty pictures isn't necessarily providing insight. We're not here in art class. We're here to save function. <laughs> so a lot of times when we start looking at how do we make these pretty track pictures, in order to do this, most people who've done this manually know that you have to edit fiber bundles off the side of it. Well, maybe those are spurious, but oftentimes those are just other connections going somewhere else. And we're actually just ignoring that, that might, those connections might be important. And the other question is, when I give you a picture of a track and say operate on this, which one of these twigs is inviolable? And which one of these twigs is not, you know, not a big deal? And the issue with this, there isn't meaning there. Whereas when we start looking at this and saying that the Broca's area and 55B need to talk to Wernicke's area and the SMA needs to talk to all of them, then these are things that are mandates. We can say, you need to keep these connected. And so annotation of the connectome, annotation of tracks is fundamental to understanding function. And function is what we care about, not the picture. But the other thing about it is, Human cognition is extremely complex. I don't think I have to tell everyone that it's hard because we've been working on it for over a hundred years and we're still just starting to crack the surface. And when we start thinking about tracks and quantification of injury and other things that people are interested in doing with tractography, we think about it, a track bundle as a unitary structure. We can come to a very rational thought where if we had a half of a track lesion, and again, I've been in discussions like this and early in my career, I thought about this, and I realized what the flaw in this was. A number, if we put a number on how good is that track bundle, it would say it's 50% preserved, but that's not real. That part is 100% preserved and that part is 0%. So the auditory and working memory part are 0% preserved, whereas this language part is 100%. But if we use a simplified view of a bundle, we would say that it's 50% preserved. That doesn't make sense. And furthermore, Saving, cutting the fiber there is the same as cutting the fiber there or anywhere else. So the reality is, if you cut the wrong fibers, a function will disappear. This is a canonical dogmatic uh, aspect of neuroscience. We, there's just no exception to that that I'm aware of. But if you also, if you back off irrelevant fibers, you leave tumor, and thus it is critically important that we know what we need to back off and what we don't. We need to get better data to answer this question and just focusing on the SLF or RQ by itself will not get us there. So what I'm gonna talk about is a couple of things that I think will help us better understand how to utilize this really powerful technology to understand uh, how we can do better at this. 
And there's a couple of points that I'm going to try to convince you of. The first is that networks are the organizing principle of the mammalian brain. I'm going to show you some pretty compelling data that we have uh, collected over the last six months that demonstrates this. Also that function is complex, particularly higher functions like abstract thinking and emotion. And while you need networks to do this, there may be interactions that we need to continue to study and, inter and determine to do better at this as well. <clears throat> we'll talk about the duality of, of cognition where we've been arguing for a hundred years whether the function is focal or not focal and the answer is it's both. And ultimately, gross anatomy and gross anatomic concepts like eloquence and track preservation cannot possibly preserve cognition in all of its domains. And I'll show you evidence for that. So when I say a complex duality, a long time ago, back in the 18, you know, late 1800s, there was a discussion of whether the brain had functions localized to an area and or were functions diffuse. And Hewlings, Jackson, and later Broca and Wernicke basically provided the evidence that things were localized in the human brain. And we know that a lot of things are. But the, uh, the answer is that as we begin to move up the phylogenic hierarchy to more complicated uh, concepts like abstraction, emotion, judgment, some of these things are a little bit less focal. And it really comes to multiple parts of the brain in its first way working in complex ways. So the analogy I say is that we have learned and physicists learned a long time ago that light is both a wave and a particle. And you just have to be comfortable with that duality that uh, certain models are good for certain concepts. And we have to think about that with function. Now, the network concept arises from the fact that we know that areas of the brain that are not immediately next to each other have highly synchronized activity. They're not perfect. They're not exactly always firing together because if they were, there'd probably be some kind of seizure. But they frequently fire together. And we know the reason for this in general is that they're doing things in common. They have common tasks and they commonly are activated together. Now, if you take the brain and you divide it up and you say every part of the brain needs to be aligned to its closest axis. And there's a reason the number seven was picked, but we won't, won't go into it. It's a statistical reason. You start to see some patterns that are reproducible. The sensory motor system is a network. The visual system is a network and so is the limbic system. But the quote unquote association cortex, which is of course an absurd idea because it just means we don't know what's in there. Um, it can be broken up into the central executive network, the default mode network, the salience network, and the dorsal tension network. The best way to think about these, this is not clinically practicable because it basically says that everything in the brain is eloquent and you can't operate on it, which we know is not true. But the question is, um, they're really thinking about them as the general axes of how the brain is overall organized. Now, if you get more stringent with your statistical thresholds, some of these networks break in half. And you can see that, for example, the default mode network is actually four networks that are talking more to each other than they are to everybody else, but they're talking more to themselves than they are to the other parts of the DMN. So you look on the right, you get something that looks a lot more like what any, those of us who are familiar with networks are, are, are uh, used to, this kind of 17 network model. And I'm going to dive into this a little bit because this is where a lot of the confusion comes. When we describe a network, we should not cut the network, we're often talking about pores of networks. So for example, that brown network, it's kind of in different places, is the central executive network core. And now you can see that this may make surgery a lot more realistic because most of the brain isn't CN core. Same as default mode network core. And these are kind of the drivers who drive the entire axes. You have this kind of red network, which is the language system. It's part of the DMN overall, but it's not really part of the core DMN. You have the dorsal attention network and the salience. You also have these kind of newer networks. One's called multiple demand. This was discovered about four years ago, um, but it's been re reproduced many times. And it's plot to organize these networks and get them to coordinate with each other. The ventral attention network um, is in pink. And you can see what's also interesting is that the hand and, hand, uh, and leg motor cortex is actually not part of the same network as the face, which is actually part of the primary auditory system and insula as well. The insula, the back of the insula, this part of the insula is actually synchronized with the stomach. So it's kind of a complex face, gut, ear uh, axes together. And it makes sense why those guys would talk to each other a lot. And obviously in the back, you see the visual system. That blue area is probably where episodic memory. So if you've memorized the Papez circuit in medical school, this is where that's mainly located. 
And well, when you get down to what networks do we think are probably worth drawing the line at? Because you have to draw a line somewhere. That, as you see, all the brain is some part of some network. In general, we would recommend that the five big networks, which are the three core of the DMN, core of sal uh, CN, salience, and two attention networks, seem to have the most data to say that directly transgressing them causes problems. And I'll talk about that in a bit. But the issue with it is, this looks really random and hard to understand. Um, and if you, what's even more interesting is when we look at the striatum, a good portion of the striatum has a bold signal activation pattern that is highly correlated with not the motor system. This again, the motor system is that kind of turquoise part. And if you look, that's only a tiny part of the putamen. Most of the caudate, most of the putamen, and actually most of the cerebellum is not motor. It's actually cognitive. And this raises some really interesting questions, right? Because it seems that these things are very, very patterned, but also it's kind of intractable. Why does it look like this? So there, there's a really interesting point that a guy named Randy Buckner pointed out at the meeting a few years ago that intrigued me, which is that that doesn't look random. That looks like patterning, like segments. And given that we know that the brain and one point the spinal cord were fairly similar, they're two, part of the neural tube, this actually raised an interesting point. Is this embryological or evolutionary? I'm going to show you evidence that it absolutely is. Now, what we know with gyri and sulci is that while there's some patterns to them, any, everyone here, I think, doesn't need to be told that aspects of the gyri and sulci are not very good at predicting function. And part of the reason is we know that there's not really a genetic patterning that causes the gyri to look like they do. It's just due to the thickening of the cortical mantle causing the brain to double over around white matter and new fibers. So that's why gyral anatomy provides us some ideas because there are some basic patterns in the white matter, but there's enough variability that people have differences, particularly in some of the quote unquote association areas. The question though, and the really intriguing part is if you look at these networks, you see these triads and these are the triads of the core networks, CN and brown, yellow default mode, and red, which is the language system. You actually see that multiple times. And so you also see that in the cerebellum. You can see it actually in the basal ganglia right there. That's pretty striking. So where's that come from? Well, in order to do this, we have to really go back to the embryologic neural tube because this is where you know, mammals are most similar. And in order to do this, you have to unfold the brain. Well, we all know the brain is a C, but I don't think many of us have really gone through the detail of how did it actually fold that way and why? Well, it's not genetic. It's basically as the mammalian brain grew, it just was forced to fold over on itself and it flips, it actually flips around the Lehman Insula. So in order to fold it, you have to actually turn the, the temporal lobe upside down. It's a very difficult rotation to do mentally, but we know that's true because the hippocampus in, in primates is actually upside down from the hippocampus in rodents. So we know that it had to double over, it looked like something like this. So we know that it has to flip. So in order to really study this, we first have to flatten out all the gyri, which we did here. We have to fold the brain into, its, into a, something resembling its embryonic configuration. And you get this plate. Now, the way to think about this is, this is the outer part of the neural tube at that stage that I just showed you in embryonic development. Again, this is where mammals are, you know, start to diverge from each other in brain development. Now, when you look at this, again, it looks chaotic, but it's not. So if you look at the beginning here, you have the, the motor strip sort of in the center. On one side, you have the dorsal attention in purple, uh, sorry, in green, and the salience in purple. You have a mirror image on the other side. You have the multiple demand and the, and the ventral attention network, mirror image. Now, if you put the visual and auditory systems here, what this gives you a place where these triads just repeat over and over again. Now, we went to the length of saying, is this some kind of embryological configuration? So in order to do this, we went through every cytoarchitecture atlas that is out there. We went through and compared every single animal atlas back to birds that we could get our hands on. And we traced when did our every parcel in the, in the human nervous system appear in evolution? What, when did it split off from another parcel? When did it show up when it wasn't there before? And if you look at uh, the macaque and you say, well, if you have a parcel that has similar side of architecture in the same basic location, let's make the assumption that it's basically probably in the same network. 
we get a map like this. So we can basically map and say, where do we think the networks were, are in the CACs? And when you do that, what you get is this. This is their connectome on the right and ours on the left. We added one and a half of these little triads. We increased the temporal triad. We stuck a triad right behind the motor cortex and the inferior parietal lobule. We know that's unique to humans. And we stuck something at the frontal pole. Now, if you look at the macaque areas, those are the areas that the uh, psychiatrists uh, uh, treat with TMS. So it's kind of the emotional part. That's the, that's the frontal pole in the cats. They don't have this cognitive triad in the front. And what's really interesting is macaques have a fully formed Broca's area. They don't have all the other stuff. They don't have a developed default mode network. So while they might be able to communicate with sounds, that's why they don't make more coherent speech. There's other reasons, but that's a big one. Now, if you roll back to cats, you basically get to the core of salience, a little bit of multiple demand, but not much. It's not really well developed. And uh, uh, ventral attention network and dorsal attention network. That's all they have. And so, again, you think that doing a frontal lobectomy is, is meaningless. Remember that you're basically reducing that hemisphere to the cat hemisphere. And so when we basically take this primitive neural tube and we put it into its configuration, and we line it up along the corticospinal tract. Interestingly, the white matter bundles become straight up and down. So if you start looking at what these bu bundles are basically doing, IFOF and ILF and Uncinet are hooking up the triads, the new human triads to the visual system, the ones in the temporal, the ones in the uh, uh, frontal pole to the visual system, because these are almost the equivalent of intersegmental arteries or intersegmental connections of the spinal cord. It's a very common pattern in, this, in the spinal cord and it's common in the central tube. It's just that when the brain physically folds, this is what we get. The cingulum is basically hooking up the medial triads and the SLF is hooking up the triads to themselves. That's a simple pattern there. Now, even if you start looking at MDLF, it's hooking up um, basically older areas to the visual system. Now, if we line up this with the striatum here and the cerebellum, the, the overlap is striking. Now, you can see here that a lot of these patterns are in the exact location that you would expect them to be given that orientation. And if you look at the cerebellum, this is what's really fascinating. Just follow the numbers on the two sides. There's the triad showing up. So what it's doing, the cerebellum is mainly doing is tracing the, the frontal pole of macaques. It's that, that area being represented. And the, and the really frontal polar regions in, in, that show up in humans don't exist in macaques, so they aren't in the cerebellum really. Now, if you look at these triads, this was what we would call the cognitive triad. There's the emotional triad in macaques. The executive triad, this is the cognitive and executive are unique to humans and the semantic triad. It's supposed to be semantic, but it's spelled that. Now, interestingly, after, right after we finished all of this work, someone published this paper in Cell, this is about two months ago. And what they basically looked at is they put macaques into an fMRI and did this analysis. So what's really interesting is there's the emotional triad, it's very polar in macaques, and the executive triad in humans. So this isn't just our warping in cyber architecture, it lines up with the actual data. And so what it gets down to is networks, are the organizing principle of the mammalian brain, full stop. So should we try to preserve them? Well, if they're the organizing principle, as much as possible, we should. We can't always do that, obviously. But the answer is, um, we don't have RCTs saying we should not cut network anatomy and destroy it. We also have RCTs saying we shouldn't cut the optic nerve and cortical spinal tract, but once we understand the anatomy and principles and, func and concept why, which in a, a, a structure is organized in the nervous system, it's safe to say that destroying it is likely to, to damage that function. And if you look at the big five networks, the ones that I said that it's worth putting your, hand, your line in the sand about, there's a lot of evidence that dysfunction or damage to these networks causes cognitive, emotional, neurologic symptoms. So this is a meta-analysis we performed. We screened through 22,000 papers published in the last 10 years. We found hundreds of papers that show that one, of, one or more problems, either structural or functional with these networks across almost every disease, including brain tumors, causes cognitive, emotional, neurologic symptoms. And so when we start looking at this, we start looking at cases like lensular gliomas, we spend a lot of time thinking about eloquence, but it's not always in the tumor or near it, but these are always there. And so 
we started to work with groups to accumulate evidence to try to analyze this. This is a, a work that um, we uh, uh, assisted the Barrow Neurological Institute with working on. And they were looking at calf mouse and trajectories. And to make a long story short, this covers a pretty large swath of, of data. And to summarize a very complex analysis, damage to the default mode, salience, parts of the dorsal tension network, and interesting, the right frontal pole, which most of us think is pretty safe, we're linked to a drop in the modified Rankin score. So this is not subtle cognitive neuropsych changes that maybe only one person can find. This is a pretty significant stuff that's observable to the neurosurgeons. Now, good to save networks. But we know that there's another side of this duality. Some of these functions don't map neatly to networks. So yes, if it requires part of the network to do a function like math, and it requires a lot of part of lots of networks, then destroying that was likely to take math away or at least make it worse. But we start looking at functions like higher emotions. And this is a, these are maps of activity patterns during having a higher emotion. So for example, joy and guilt. You can notice that in order to really understand joy and guilt, you need to understand the behavior of lots and lots of parcels. To give you an, an idea of what this map is actually showing you, these are the Human Connectome Project ACP atlases below in the red are areas that are on and off. So if I know the status of these parcels, I can predict the emotion. This is a, a paper that came out of Japan uh, about two years ago. And we can do that for all emotions. Now, what's interesting is it isn't random what parcels matter. So it really certain areas like the default mode and the salience network and parts of the CN are really important for this. The visual system, things at the frontal pole, um, less important. Again, that's why we call it the emotional triad. The frontal pole is not part of emotions, really. It's part of executive function, higher cognition, judgment, things that make us adults, but it's not part of emotions. But they've mapped out all of them. And essentially, we can take all emotions and express them as a, a linear combination of you know, so for example, you can be both joy and romance in the same one. But the fact of the matter is that these are discrete states. In order to understand these states, you have to understand lots of different aspects of how these networks are talking to each other. Now, of course, destroying these networks seems highly likely to change this, but it isn't necessary, it isn't sufficient to just under, just, just save the DMN and then everything will be fine. And so while these emotions are largely linked to these networks, and they're largely in the macaque regions, the emotional triad and other parts of the DMM. The answer is, it's still a complex state. And so people are developing more sophisticated tools for beginning to look through how do you analyze brain states through things like functional MRI. This is a great nature paper a while back. What they did was they took an a, a, a MRI while people were learning, and they looked at all the brain states that the brain transited. Those are those little circles on the, or dot circles on the line. And what they found is that while learning, different people transit different states. So they really found two patterns. The pattern on the lower left is a person whose brain went through the same core states for most processes, whether they were learning math, whether they were learning reading, et cetera. The person on the right could parallelize, have diffuse brain states for all of those situations. The person on the left is a C student, and the person on the right is an A student. And this is consistent. It's a highly strong, it's a strong correlation in this paper. But what it shows is that how we transit and, and modulate states is really important. And this becomes really complex because if I tell you that we have to not only maintain the networks, but how they talk to each other, how do we even possibly figure this out? Well, there are tools um, that we've been exploring for a long time that can start to dive into inter-network communication and how do we preserve this as much as possible. So in order to make the brain into a math equation, what you have to do is you have to take the brain, do DTI, and parcelate it, and you calculate how many fibers connect everything and everything else. And you can you now have a giant math equation. And you can do experiments on this math equation. So I'll show you some experiments that we've done, and either have published or have submitted. So one is the concept of hubness. So hubness, hubs are parts of the brain that are highly connected compared to other parts of the brain. We know that all parts of the brain are equal, and the biggest part of the hub in the brain is the brain stem. That's surprising. Now, who are the hubs of the brain? <laughs> we know this is important because hubs express different genes. They use more energy, and they're actually more susceptible to diseases like Alzheimer's, and some people claim that Alzheimer's is a like hubopathy. But who are they? 
Now, what we know, again, is that these are the top 10 across hundreds and hundreds of individuals we run through the algorithm. And if you were to rate, grade an AVM using the Spessler Martin scale, those guys get you the point. And I would argue these should get you the point too, but they weren't in the scale. Now, those are areas are eloquent. So eloquent areas are hubs. They're highly connected. If you take them out, something's pretty bad, it's obvious. But the next question is, well, we know that there's variability between people. And do people all have the same basic hubs? And the answer is mostly yes, but. So what you're looking at here is this is a paper we published two years ago in Journal of Neuroncology. It's a heat map and each column is a different person. And essentially the order is fixed from the average order. So the number one on the top of that square there is the brain stem and at the bottom is part of the parietal lobe. And they're ranked by hubness. Now the colors are for that individual um, where the discordance is. And what we found, if you look at, look at this, is that hubs are very consistent for the most part, but 7% of people have hubs in the brain where other people don't have them. And this is things like the frontal pole. So that might be part of the individual variability that we're, of why some people we do a tiny cav mal and then they never really go back to normal and they have all these complaints and other people we do a frontal lobectomy and they don't. Another way we can start to get at individual variability is looking at path in the brain. So how connected are parts of the brain? How easy is it for information to flow in the brain? How do we understand how these states could be maintained and maintain the overall architecture? So a shortest path in the brain in this graph would be like this, because it's going down the biggest fiber bundles. Now, we know that having a shorter path in the brain in general is correlated with higher IQ. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but it's a pretty good thing to have short paths in your brain. Now, when we do surgery, we lengthen the path. So how much do we lengthen it? What things lengthen it the most? What I'm gonna show you is some data that is currently under review that took us almost two years to sort out. So what we did was we first calculated for the brain, what are all the shortest paths? What's the average path length? And you get a number called global efficiency. So more efficient brains have shorter path lengths. Now, what we did is we created an algorithm to do every realistic brain surgery. So this means things that are all kind of next to each other in, in, in a ball. Not that we took out two parcels on opposite sides of the brain. And so we did that to the graph. We did every possible brain surgery on uh, over hundred individuals. We did that to the graph and recalculated every step with every possible surgery, starting from one parcel to the whole lobe, uh, what, what did that do to the efficiency? Now, when we get the results, this is what, what it is. So this is one person undergoing every surgery possible up to a lobectomy in all of these lobes. And everyone's brain looks like this that we've ever studied, and every lobe looks like this. So there's no exceptions to the sawtooth pattern. What the sawtooth pattern is, each one of these lines is a different surgery of what, it's, what the global efficiency is when you do that. And as you can see, in general, the more of the brain you remove, you gradually drop your efficiency. Not a lot, but it goes down. Now, what's really interesting is the sawtooth thing is that in this individual, there are surgeries that it would be better off to remove more of the brain than remove that area or that combination of areas. And we spent a lot of time, really over two years, looking into this in, in, in detail that would boggle your mind. But basically, to summarize this work, what we found is that there are patterns. There isn't, everyone isn't a random snowflake, but they're not all the same either. There are things called connective types. And so if in this individual, they're in the parietal lobe across individuals, there are two basic connective types. One is the 7AM connective type and one is the PFM connective type. And the PFM connective type means that if I know who the hub of your parietal lobe is, PFM will always show up very early unless you want to be medial and vice versa for the other one. Again, it's telling you which is the worst place to be in, you know, which were the worst two, and they're exclusive. Um, people are either one or the other. There's no real exceptions to this. So this raises the possibility of you utilizing simple artificial intelligence to begin to try to figure out where's the place we shouldn't be entering that we may not know that we shouldn't be entering. So I don't think I have to tell everyone to not put a cannula through the motor cortex, but there might be traps in a person that we don't know are actually worse than moving the cannula two millimeters to the left. But how can we learn more? How can we start to say, 
well, maybe this isn't going to take down your global efficiency, but it's going to hurt your emotional regulation because you are a little bit different than everyone else. Remember, the brain is infinitely complex. So artificial intelligence on resting state fMRI can provide some insight into this. So when you're laying in an fMRI, you can, your brain is talking in all sorts of different ways, different parts of the brain are communicating. This is networks, and this is what networks mean. And while there are variability between people, there's also areas that are very consistent. Again, the networks have consistent relationships with each other and with, um, with themselves. So we can quantify that. And when we quantify that for every combination of parts of the brain, we map a functional connectome. Now, what's the real so what of this is that the literature has shown extensively that in mental illness, in pep movement disorders, even in brain tumor patients, that the connectivity is altered in unique ways and that these link directly to symptoms. And so when you look at the functional connectome in a thoughtful way with powerful tools, you can begin to try to figure out what's specific about this person. Why are they having the symptoms they're having? And this opens up the idea that we can actually begin to take control of this situation. So interventional neurorehabilitation involves looking at both the structural connectome and its functional consequences. The functions that we see in our patients, the phenotypic present presentation is a combination of the, what the structural architecture that person has in their head and how it's talking to itself, what's firing with what. And we can study this quantitative and make good decisions to try to help patients improve faster or make better decisions in the operating room. So what happens when we remove part of the connectome? Put a hole there, right? Now that hole may directly disconnect something. We may cut the corticospinal tract. It's no longer connected to the spinal cord paralysis. Easy to understand that. But there are more complex relationships. And this is really true when we start talking about cognition. So what if we put a hole in the middle of the central executive network or dorsal tension network, or even the motor system? Well, they're talking to other areas. And what's gonna happen is you see these red and blue circles, there's gonna be changes in how the areas are communicating. It's a knock-on effect. And that functional disconnectivity is often the cause of the neurological deficit. We've seen this in our patients doing TMS. Most people who are hemiplegic after well-conducted motor strip area surgery are not because we cut the cortical spinal tract or caused a stroke. It's because of the functional disconnectivity from the results of what we did. And that's correctable. That's correctable stimulation. And these patients often improve very, very quickly in our experience. So we know that the structure plus functional overlay leads to phenotype. And we know that in mental illness, it is almost impossible to accurately describe the phenotype without having this data. So in this paper in Nature Medicine, they identified with functional connectivity that depression is at least four different diseases that have different symptoms and different responses to treatment. So they're different diseases. So of course, when we put everyone on the same medicine, it works for some people, not others. It's like putting a cast on everyone's arm because you know that there's a bone broken somewhere in the body. It doesn't help the legs very well. And so similarly, <laughs> if we try to direct brain stimulation without really knowing who is the person we're treating, what is actually wrong with them, we're, we might have some people get better and other people not. But what we found consistently over our experience is that when we begin to look at a patient who we did a surgery like this and they wake up very weak, when we begin to look at the, the begin to look at the connectome here again in this particular case, you see the corticospinal tract is fine. Okay, motor system is fine, but this guy's absolutely hemiplegic. Now the question is why and as we begin to have tools that show us things like functional connectivity, we can begin to inquire, well, just because those areas are connected doesn't mean they're intercommunicating correctly. And there can be areas on the other side that are uh, firing in ways that overactivate these areas and uh, prevent them from functioning normally. So I'll show you in this patient that this is actually the case. Whenever this very long video is. So, when we look at the, the sensory motor network, you can see that this is a resting state functional connectivity map of the connectome. And you can see that there's a seed inside the motor cortex that's in yellow. Now, this should be basically a kind of medium red, but you see that there's some dark reds and there's some blues on the other side. Well, that's not how the sensory motor system is supposed to work. It's a network. It's supposed to talk to each other. Red is correlated. It should be correlated. So what we know is that the other side here is actually part of the problem. When we put our hole next to where the tumor was and took some of the neurons that came with it, we see that, that 
For example, parts of the parietal lobe, SMA, you see that blue area, that should not be uh, asynchronous with the motor system. That's functional disconnectivity. So we stimulated at the SMA and we turned down the, the, the good side. And this patient recovered within four days. We have videos of this. So it really shows that having a better understanding of the connectome is essential to making good decisions, to understanding what's going on and prognosticating. And really, in this case, this patient did not need to be hemiplegic. They just needed TMS. And so how do we know where to look? Well, this is where artificial intelligence is very important. So if we map the functional and structural connectome at scale, and we turn loose the kind of tools that Facebook used to sell, sell us ads, we can then start to look and say, well, where are the symptoms coming from? What's the prognosis? Why do these people, what kind of disease does this person with depression really have? And so in order to do that, you need to build industrial grade hyperclusters. There's machine learning applications called AutoML that can, and what you're looking at with all these dots, is this is the AI running every conceivable hyperperimeter setting to find the answer to what, what is the, the phenotype of the connectome that explains the clinical data. So if we start thinking about diseases like schizophrenia and, and even the types of symptoms we see, they're complicated and multi-circuit. In order to break down and find what circuit that is, what should we be preserving? We need to be able to say that anxiety is a circuit in the brain. It should be the same sets of circuits in everybody who has it, whether they got there from brain cancer, from trauma, from schizophrenia or depression. Because once we understand the circuit, we can act. We can put electrodes, we can stimulate, we can do focus ultrasound, it goes on and on and on. But what we have to do is we have to begin to understand the machine learning, uh, what machine learning people do so that they ask the question correctly. So we don't care about predicting who has hallucinations in, in schizophrenia patients, we can ask the patient. We wanna know where is the problem. So you gotta build the algorithms differently and you get basically maps of the brain that link symptoms to parts of the brain. And again, these circuits are complex. You can see that this is actually all the symptoms of depression, predicting where they're located in the brain. So where did the suicidal thoughts come from? We can localize that. And once you can localize it and really put this into real time uh, action, it really ha can have a revolutionary effect for really helping doctors understand what's going on. Now, finally, this is really a fascinating theory of where do symptoms like mental illness actually come from? And I can't take credit for this, but I think that this is just such awesome work. So you can see Danielle Bassett at Penn. It's really amazing work. She won a MacArthur Genius Award for this. And the concept is, that if you remember when I talked about brain states, so a brain state is what parcels are on and what neurons are on at a given time point when you're in a particular mental state. Now, let's say theoretically, we're trying to represent these mushrooms. Well, given a structural connectome, that may be easy or hard to get your brain into that state. Now, reason for it is this. So if I wanna get that toy diagram, that structural connectome into that functional state, I need to, and I want or I wanna switch it there between states, that switch is easy because I only have to put a plus and a minus. Whereas switching that into that state is really hard. I have to put more, put more energy into it. And so what you can do is you can quantify how hard is it for the brain to get into any state possible given your structural connectome. So if, you, if I look at your wiring diagram, how hard is it to get your brain into a specific state? And so once you calculate energy costs, you can map it onto this landscape where how hard is it that peak is how hard it is to get your brain into a state. And then if that state is joy and it's hard to get your brain into that, there you go, there's depression for you. Now, it turns out that as we mature, our central executive networks also mature. And the CN's main job is to get the brain into difficult energy states. So as we, if, if for example, you're wired one way, this state may be, become easier. Maybe you don't want that state, but this state may become harder. And maybe that's the state you want. So as your CN begins to mature, your brain starts to navigate the landscape better. It puts your brain into all of these states. And the evolving evidence says that many of these conditions uh, that have genetic basis like depression and schizophrenia, which, have, which really are related a lot of times to the patterns of wiring in the brain or different ways that the brain works, result in the landscape being abnormal. And that the reason schizophrenia doesn't begin to appear until adolescence or even adulthood is that your brain can't actually get yourself into the hallucination or delusion state. 
But the question then is, of course, if we want to make states more easy or hard, can we basically say, well, I want to make that guilt state harder to get into and the joy state easier to get into? Well, then we can start to think mathematically of how we can put stimulation in different parts of the brain to change the landscape and make these states easier or harder. And again, this is where I think the field is headed, but also we will have to start to account for that in the future with, and obviously not with, by thinking really hard about it, by using tools that actually do that. So how can we possibly tackle this challenge? First, we have to start moving beyond gross anatomy and understanding the brain is complex and we need tools that are equally complex. We need to align our models with how the brain works, at least how we understand that it works giving existing data and not necessarily what's easy to make a picture of that we can put into a grant. And we have to view this as a mathematics issue and not an artistic issue, because ultimately, as I showed in the last diagram, the, the, the end result, the phenotype we see in the brain results from the mathematics of neural activation. So thanks everyone. Yeah, that's interesting. So when we were talking about, when we were looking through the connectotype concept, we wanted to work through and say, not where's the individual parcel, because we know that we can't act at that level probably with our hands. What we're talking about is the, if you look at, if you go through it again, it's a huge paper. So, um, but in, in summary, the connectotypes are the epicenters. And actually it's like what center, if I look at the lateral parietal lobe, for example, what basic place do I not want to be? Uh, where's the center of badness for you? Because again, you know, what combination of four parcels would be a bad one for you to cut? Because we usually never cut one, we cut two or three usually. The answer is, if you look at those two connectotypes, they're about that far apart. So it really would be something that's actionable at this time point. Having said that, when you get into connectome imaging, if you really spend the time to really you know, implement tight um, co-registration and, and really spend time refining your atlases, yeah, we're in, most of the parcels are about yay big. So it's, we're close to the point where we, you know, we can image at that. The challenge, of course, is depends on what kind of operation you're doing. If you're doing LID or C, SEG or something, and robotics, you probably can work at that level of, but we start, if we talk about traditional craniotomies, no, I mean, we, obviously the brain's going to shift more and more. So a lot of times when I think when we think about traditional open craniotomies, it's a guideline. Like, well, on the front of this, there's some bad stuff and it's running about here and this is when you need to pay attention. We probably can't operate with our hands in an open craniotomy to that level of precision right now. Um, quick question about, I'm sure you follow these patients post-operatively doing, uh, you know, uh, tractography and see, um, you know, neuro rehab or TMS and see how they might improve clinically and maybe radiographically. Uh, is, is any data how systemic therapies impact that, like, like a um, clinical trial looking at just post-surgical patients and their tracks recovering, TMS, whatnot, whatever, neuro rehab tools versus those that have radiation? versus those that had radiation and systemic therapy? Um, I, I believe there's some small studies. The challenge with it is that for a long time, tractography was really dogged by um, free water washout. So if you have edema or all these kind of things, oftentimes you couldn't track through it. So if you saw an absence of tracks in the middle of the lesion, was it because the tracks were gone or, or how much track was missing from this and how much of it was just artifact of washout? But now that there's beginning to become edema removing algorithms that perform pretty well, we're getting a lot closer to being able to do that study in a valid way. What's actually a lot harder to do is getting a true quantitative number on a, tra on a track that's actually reproducible between scanners, between people that you say, there's 42 fibers and that's not normal. There's a lot of things you can do to try to improve that, but it's a very you know wicked hard problem that I can almost give an hour lecture on now of how to really get truly quantitative tractography. Having said that, we're really starting to get on the preface of having those kind of tools to answer that question in a way that isn't just a sideball and like, yeah, it looks good or bad. So we'll start to have some insight into that, I think, um, because the tools are just so new. I mean, these are, this, this, the, the technology is evolving very quickly. Ron? A very different type of question. How do you think this type of work really translates to artificial intelligence? Um, you mean to knowing about our, like how we drive artificial intelligence? Yes. 
Well, you know, nowadays the, the big vogue in AI science is actually try to learn something about the brain and bring it over because, you know, in short, convolutional neural nets are explicitly modeled after the Hubel and Weasel model. That was the thought process. So we know that when you start to take brain architectural diagrams and put it into a machine learning algorithm or deep learning algorithm, some really potent things can come out of it. Having said that, not all of those things work out. An interesting thing that I came across in all my travels to various meetings was I heard a talk by a guy at Google. And what they were doing is trying to map the microconnectome. Now, microconnectomic mapping is probably not possible right now with existing computing speed. It's just not, there's no computers in the world fast enough to do it. For example, at last count to micro map EM connections and disentangle them on um, of human cortex uh, of 100 nanometers cubed was somewhere around 10 to the fourth man hours of work. So reconstructing the brain is probably not possible. In fact, the European Union set out about a decade ago to do that. And then they had to re, you know, at the first meeting say, all right, let's tone back to like, let's make the technologies that may make this possible. So what the Google was working on, how do we find smarter algorithms to do this? And someone asked, why is Google interested in this? And they said, well, Google wants to see if there's any, any lower level architecture that might be useful for a neural net. It's an interesting idea. So people are doing that. The challenge with it is what we found is that every time we've started to understand kind of the, from some lower level, how the microcircuitry of the brain does it, it's just, it actually is quantum leaps above what we're generating ourselves. So yeah, well, as people begin to understand microcircuitry, inevitably there will be people, you know, it's, the brain solved this in a pretty elegant way, we should try to do that. Um, and so for example, one of the really biggest breakthroughs of the last year is a technique called large language process, uh, large language processing. Natural language processing has been around for a while and it reads documents and you know, does some kind of interpretation on it. But it, it's really a parser. It just reads stuff and puts it into a database that you can do machine learning on. Large language processing is actually, and I've seen some credible things where people can actually read the medical literature and do a meta-analysis automatically that, that reads like a human. And so it's a quantum leap. And some of the architectures behind that are actually very similar neural type architectures that people have adapted from language models.